a deafening silence surrounded the disappearance of Edward V and his brother, Richard, Duke of York. Both Richard III and Henry Tudor had good reasons not to talk publicly about the princess. Locked in the tower in June 1483 with his younger brother, the 12-year-old Edward V was certain that death was facing him. Two overthrown kings had died in suspicious circumstances already this century. Yet it was still possible their uncle, Richard III, would spare them. The princess was so very young, and if it were accepted that they were bastards, as their uncle claimed, they would pose little threat. The innocent Richard, Duke of York, only nine years old, remained joyous and full of frolics, even as the last of their servants were dismissed. But the boys were spotted behind the tower windows less and less often, and by the summer's end they had vanished. Their disappearance that lies at the heart of the many conspiracy, theories over what happened to the princes. Murder was suspected, but without bodies no one could be certain even that they were dead. Many different scenarios have been put forward in the years since. In the nearest surviving contemporary accounts, Richard is accused of ordering their deaths, with the boys either suffocated with their bedding, or drowned, or killed by having their arteries cut. There were also theories that one or both of the princes escaped. Richard III was innocent of ordering the children's deaths and instead spirited his nephews abroad or to a safe place nearer home, only for them to be killed later by Henry VII who feared the boys' rival claims to the throne. None of these theories, however, has provided a satisfactory answer to the riddle at the heart of this mystery, the fact the boys simply vanished. If the princes were alive, why did Richard not say so in October 1483, when the rumors he had ordered them killed? If they were dead, why had he not followed earlier examples of royal killings? The bodies of deposed kings were displayed in claims made that they had died of natural causes so that loyalties could be transferred to the new king. That the answer to these questions lies in the 15th century seems obvious, if Richard III was a religious man and a good king, as many believe he was, then he could not have ordered the deaths of two children. But even good people do bad things if they're given the right motivation. In the 15th century it was a primary duty of good kingship to ensure peace and national harmony. After his coronation, Richard III continued to employ many of his brother Edward IV's former servants, but by the end of July 1483 it was already clear that some did not accept that Edward IV's sons were illegitimate and judged Richard to be a usurper. The fact the princes remained a focus of opposition gave Richard a strong motive for having them killed, just as his brother had killed the king he deposed. The childlike, helpless. Lancastrian Henry VI was found dead in the tower in 1471, after more than a decade of conflict between the rival royal houses of Lancaster and York. It was said he was killed by grief and rage over the death in battle of his son, but few can have doubted that Edward IV ordered Henry's a murder. Henry VI's death extirpated the house of Lancaster. Only Henry VI's half-nephew, Henry Tudor, a descendant of John of Gaunt, founder of the Lancastrian house, through his mother's illegitimate Beaufort line, was left to represent their cause. Trapped in European exile, Henry Tudor posed a negligible threat to Edward IV. However, Richard was acutely aware of an unexpected sequel to Henry VI's death. The murdered king was acclaimed as a saint, with rich and poor alike venerating him as an innocent whose troubled life gave him some insight into their own difficulties. Miracles were reported at the site of his modest grave in Chertsey Abbey, Surrey. One man claimed that the dead king had even deigned to help him when he had a bean trapped in his ear, with said bean popping out after he prayed to the deposed king. Edward IV failed to put a halt to the popular cult and Richard III shared his late brother's anxieties about its ever-growing power. It had a strong following in his home city of York where a statue of Henry the Saint was built on the choir screen at York Minster. In 1484 Richard attempted to take control of the cult with an act of reconciliation, moving Henry VI's body to St. George's Chapel, Windsor. In the meantime, there was a high risk the dead princes too would attract a cult, for in them the religious qualities attached to royalty were combined with the purity of childhood. An Insecure King 
In England we have no equivalent today to the shrine at Lourdes in France, visited by thousands of pilgrims every year looking for healing or spiritual renewal. The vanishing of the princes was for Richard a case of least said, soonest mended, for without a grave for them, there could be no focus for a cult. Without a body or items belonging to the dead placed on display, there would be no relics either. Nevertheless, Richard needed the prince's mother, Elizabeth Woodville, and others who might follow Edward V, to know the boys were dead, in order to forestall plots raised in their name. According to the Tudor historian Polyder Virgil, Elizabeth Woodville fainted when she was told her sons had been killed. As she came round, she wept, she cried out loud, and with lamentable shrieks made the entire house ring, she struck her breast, tore and cut her hair. She also called for vengeance. Elizabeth Woodville made an agreement with Henry Tudor's mother, Margaret Beaufort, that Henry should marry her daughter, Elizabeth of York, and called on Edwardian loyalists to back their cause. The rebellion that followed in October 1483 proved Richard had failed to restore peace. While he defeated these risings, less than two years later at the Battle of Bosworth, in August 1485, he was betrayed by part of his own army and was killed, sword in hand. The princes were revenged, but it soon became evident that Henry VII was in no hurry to investigate their fate. It is possible that the new monarch feared such an investigation would draw attention to a role in their fate played by someone close to his cause, most likely Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham. The Duke, who came from a Lancastrian family, was a close ally of Richard and the overthrow of Edward V, but later turned against the king. Known as a sore and hard-dealing man, it is possible he encouraged Richard to have the princes murdered planning then to see Richard killed and the House of York overthrown. Richard executed Buckingham for treason in November 1483, but Buckingham's name remained associated at home and abroad with the prince's disappearance. What is certain, however, is that Henry, like Richard, had good reasons for wishing to forestall a cult of the princes. Henry's blood claim to the throne was extremely weak and he was fearful of being seen as a mere king consort to Elizabeth of York. To counter this, Henry claimed the throne in his own right, citing divine providence, God's intervention on earth, as evidence that he was a true king, for only God made kings. A key piece of evidence used in support of this idea was a story that, a few months before his murder, the Saint Henry VI had prophesied Henry Tudor's reign. It would not have been wise to allow York's royal saints to compete with the memory of Henry VI whose cult Henry VII now wished to encourage. In 1485, therefore, nothing was said of the prince's disappearance, beyond a vague accusation in Parliament during the autumn that Richard III was guilty of treasons, homicides and murders and shedding of infant's blood. No search was made for the boys' bodies and they were given no right of burial. Indeed even the fate of their souls was, seemingly, abandoned. In December 1485 when Henry issued a special charter refunding his favorite religious order, the Observant Friars, at Greenwich, he noted that offering masses for the dead was, the greatest work of piety and mercy, for through it souls would be purged. It was unthinkable not to help the souls of your loved ones pass from purgatory to heaven with prayers and masses. On the other hand, it was akin to a curse to say a requiem for a living person, you were effectively praying for their death. A surviving prince? The obvious question posed by the lack of public prayers for the princes was, were they still alive? And, as Virgil recalled, in 1491 there appeared in Ireland, as if raised from the dead one of the sons of King Edward. A youth by the name of Richard. Henry VII said the man claiming to be the younger of the princes was, in fact, a Dutchman called Perkin Warbeck, but who could be sure? Henry was more anxious than ever that the princes be forgotten and when their mother, Elizabeth Woodville, died in June 1492, she was buried privily. Without any solemn dirge done for her obit. It has been suggested this may have reflected her dying wishes to be buried without pomp. But Henry VII also asked to be buried without pomp. He still expected, and got, one of the stateliest funerals of the Middle Ages. Elizabeth Woodville emphatically did not receive the same treatment. Henry's motives become clear when recalled in the context 